Hello and welcome to my week of reading from Blood and Ash by Jennifer L. Armentrout. This is the Blades and Bodice Rippers book club pick, so I have until today is Monday. Today is Monday after work, after ish. I mean, I stopped a little early. Shh, don't tell anyone. And I gotta read this chunky book before Saturday, before our live show. And I kind of thought that it would be fun to vlog me reading it. So this won't be like my usual reading vlogs. Like, I don't really intend to like. It's a work week, so I don't really intend to be like filming like me cooking and like aesthetic shots of the candles and lighting. I just kind of want to capture my real time thoughts as I make my journey through this book that like I'm given to believe based on what people who I know that have read it and who know me um, <laughs> have said about this book. Basically that they are like 99% sure that I'm gonna hate it. I really hope they're wrong. I really hope that this vlog is like kind of boring because it's me just being like, this is great, I am loving this. Unlikely, <laughs> but ideal because this is a long ass book to be hating. So I'm, I hope that this turns into like a shatter me infernal devices situation. Be quiet out there. I am talking to the camera. Need y'all to be not driving your trucks right now. Yeah, do what I say. Yeah, I'm just gonna be reading this this week and sharing my thoughts as they come to me. And I just found out today that they're coming to fix my uh, kitchen sink uh, on Wednesday in the middle of the day, which means, and I have to be not present at all, like in my apartment for this for some reason. I think because there's gonna be like a lot of dust or something, I don't know. They're like, yeah, you can't be here. And I'm like, okay, well it's pandemic, so where am I supposed to go? <laughs> Fortunately, my parents live close by, so I'm gonna go to my parents' house. I bring it up because I'm gonna bring you along in case I have time to read while I'm there so that I can continue keeping you abreast of my thoughts and feelings. So yeah, that's what we are doing. Well, for you, it's today. For me, it's this week. <laughs> and a long week it will be if I hate this. Okay, I'm only on page 23 and I've just learned her name is Penelope, spelled P-E-N-E-L-L-A-P-H-E. -E. I had to read it like four times because I was like... <sighs> and I'm, I know fantasy books like to have like weird names, but Penelope <laughs> doesn't even sound cool. I don't like it at all. I'm also not really like, I mean, so far I'm finding it very difficult to pay attention because I don't care about what's going on. Uh, it's gonna be a long book. This is gonna be a real long video if I nitpick this much, this often, but I just couldn't. <laughs> this sentence. Like, how did an editor let this slide? It's, after all, if they had been paying attention, they would have already taken me to task over numerous things I'd already done that were forbidden to me. The double already is like that's like a first draft mistake that's like because you forgot you wrote one already already <laughs> oh man i'm on page 24. <laughs> oh no oh no there is no end in sight for my nitpicks so i'm just gonna share them and then i'll just keep whichever clips i find the most interesting but i'm gonna record everything that bothers me which is basically every line so this sentence the left, and this is not, this is not plot things. This is just bad sentences. The left door led upstairs to more private rooms where Britta had said all manner of things occurred. Now the construction of that sentence leaves it like, I mean, obviously from context because you can figure out what she was meaning to say. But the construction of that sentence makes you stop and go, wait. To more private rooms where Britta had said all manner of things occurred. It makes it sound like what you're saying is that these private rooms are a place where Britta said something. Not that these private rooms are a place where all manner of things occurred, and you know this because Britta told you that at some point that wasn't in those rooms. But the way this is constructed, to more private rooms where Britta had said, that makes it sound like you're telling me that what Britta said in those private rooms. That's a bad sentence. <laughs> Your sentence shouldn't be up for debate like that. And then, okay, so... Uh, according to them, there were many things a woman could do that brought pleasure while retaining their purity. So we're very confused here on the number of people and who these people are. So you could say many things a woman could do that brought pleasure while retaining her purity because we are talking about a singular woman 
because that's how the sentence began. There are many things a woman could do. Or you can say there are many things women could do that brought pleasure while retaining their purity. So pick one and stick with it. If we want to talk about the singular female and what she can do, sure. Or we can talk about women at large and what they can do. But many things a woman could do that brought pleasure while retaining their purity. No, that is just wrong. And I don't know who edited this and let that slide. Because we're on page 27. I'm I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I don't even know what's happening because I'm just like, but that's not how sentences work. Okay, cool. We've made it two sentences further and I'm pissed again. Purity, I hated that word, the meaning behind it. As if my virginity determined my goodness, my innocence, and its presence or lack thereof was somehow more important than the hundred choices I made every day. I mean, other than the fact that this is like not the most, is very unoriginal to be like talking about this, like, but fine, whatever. Um, as if my virginity determined my goodness. Is virginity sentient? Is virginity like a consciousness unto itself that it has the power to determine things? I think what you mean to say is that your goodness is determined by the presence or lack of virginity. Not that virginity independently is making determinations about your goodness because that is what this sentence means. Don't think that's what you mean it to mean. I hate it. I was generously going to skip over this passage, but then it got worse, so now I'm sharing it. What had Britta, the servant, said about the kind of dancing that took place at the Red Pearl? Um, for context, we were told who Britta was. I think that sentence that I complained about had Britta's name in it. If not, we've been introduced to the existence of Britta already, and we know that she's a servant. So, this reiteration of what had Britta, the servant, <laughs> said about the kind of dancing that took place. It was just, it's felt very like the servant. <laughs> like, it was just kind of, I felt like, I felt offended on behalf of Britta. Like, why you gotta bring that into it again? Like, like they know, you know, I gotta keep saying it. <laughs> but then she lowered her voice when she spoke of it and the other maid Britta had been speaking to had looked scandalized. Now, the way I read it out loud, I knew what I was reading. So like, it was clear, but when I read it the first time, like, instead of saying, and the other maid Britta had been speaking to, you could just say, and the maid Britta had been speaking to. But when you say the other maid, I thought she was saying the other maid Britta. And I was like, oh, okay, so was she saying Britta the servant before because she's distinguishing between two Brittas? And there's a Britta the servant and a Britta the maid? That's how I read it the first time because I was like, okay, well, I don't know why you're driving home the point that Britta's the servant. And then we got to, and the other maid Britta, I was like, so there's two Brittas? And then I read it again. I was like, oh no, the other maid that Britta had been speaking to. But why I gotta phrase it like that? Why can't you just say, and the maid Britta had been speaking to, you know, Britta the servant. <laughs> oh man. Oh man. I'm on page 29. <laughs> oh God. Oh my God. I'm still on page 29. But this is the second time this has happened, which is why I'm bringing it up. Because the first time I saw it, I was like, that's stupid, but whatever. Now I'm seeing it twice. And so now my problem with it is twofold. One, that it's stupid, even if you use it once. And two, to use it twice within such a few number of pages, like back to back like that, even if it was a good thing to have said, it's repetitive now. So earlier, I think, yeah, two pages before, she said, she rose, the skirt of her lilac-hued gown falling like liquid around her legs. And here, Abercrombie put it very, very well when he said that when he first started writing, his mom asked him when he came up with some flowery metaphor for like the stars in the night sky being like velvet with diamonds or whatever his mom was like is that true and he was like what and she was like is that true is that what the sky looks like does it look like velvet cloth with diamonds and he was like no no it doesn't and now he asks himself that when he writes everything is that true and that's all i could think when i read that line i was like is that true is that what a gown looks like? I mean, I get what she's going for, that it's this really slinky, silky, flowy gown, but does the gown fall like liquid? Because liquid would just continue falling off, you know? So like, you could bring liquid into it and say that it had like a liquid-like sheen or something like that, but just to say that it's falling like liquid, like the aspect of this gown that most resembles liquid is the way that it is falling meaning that it's fallen right off. <laughs> That's what I get out of that. That's bad. And so, surprise, surprise, 
Uh, two pages later, the red gown she wore was sleeveless, cut low across her chest, and the fabric clung to her body like liquid. So these are the two things that liquid does that most resembles these dresses. It falls and it clings like liquid. Again, the thing that I think would be the takeaway to, to say that liquid, that how to involve liquid with these dresses, would be most likely the sheen, the shimmer, the like flowiness of it. Then you could bring liquid into it. But apparently liquid falls and clings, and these dresses fall and cling like liquid. Find a new new word because this one's getting old and it's bad. <laughs> Need to get off page 29, but I'm pissed again. <laughs> I'm gonna leave alone her description of the dancers because it's stupid, but it's fine. But I sucked in a sharp breath, my eyes swinging back to the woman before me. Is that what eyes do? Do eyes swing? Because, girl, you need to get that checked out if they are falling out of your skull and swinging. Like, that is just such a such weird imagery. Like, I know what she was going for. She was going for her being like, what? But then it is the head that is swinging, not the eyes by themselves. So, you can say, my eyes darted back to the woman. My head swung and my eyes darted back. Like, these are all options, but eyes swinging is weird. And now I'm just picturing her with her eyes hanging out of her skull being like, what? <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. Okay, this isn't grammar. This is just bad writing. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> this is so painful. Okay, so, so many things to unpack here in these three pages. Okay, so some woman, of her, so okay, for context. Also, this video is filled with spoilers, which I think is apparent since it's like my thoughts as I go. Any who's So Poppy, who... Her, what, what was her horrible actual name? Penelope, but she goes by Poppy, is at this ball that she shouldn't be at because she's like the maiden and we're not super clear on what that is yet. But obviously she's like like this protected, privileged person who has to sneak out, a la Jasmine, put a mask on and to go to this party um, where the scandalous things are happening. And some woman approaches her and, and says something about how dancing is like sex and she's like, oh, but, um, and this woman is like, it's your first time here. And she's like, what, no, what? She's like, I'd recognize everyone's face, and I know you haven't been here before, and I also know that the maiden's never been here before. And she's like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not the maiden. And she's like, Yeah, you are. <laughs> she's like, But don't worry, your secret's safe with me. And she's like, Why would my secret be safe with you? And this lady is like, You know, well, why wouldn't it be? And she's like, Because if you go and tell the Duke and Duchess, you could earn their favor. It's like she's trying to convince her to give her away, which like that's a bad strategy. But okay, so she's like, you could earn the favor of the Duke and Duchess. And the lady's like, I have no need for a favor from them. And <laughs> Poppy's brain is apparently a sleeper cell for info dumping. Because as soon as this lady says, I have no need for a favor, we get all of this followed by all of this <laughs> info dumping exposition about the hierarchy and the war and the all of this so that we can catch up with Poppy on why Poppy thinks it's ultra suspicious that this lady doesn't want a favor from the Duke and Duchess. And like, this book chose to dump us into the middle of the action without telling us anything, which is an, an absolutely valid choice to make, but you can't, like, that doesn't mean you just postpone the info dump. That means the nature of your storytelling is the kind where you trickle in information as we go. That doesn't mean when someone says something, then now you info dump for two pages to catch us up. You're going with the whole, we're picking it up as we go along, so the way this should have gone is for Poppy to just have her suspicions, but not explain them to us. Just her obviously be worried and upset about this and be like, oh my god, like if she doesn't want a favor, might she be one of these things? And then the these things aren't explained to us, but then we're sitting there going, what are the these things? And then later at some point we'll get more of a hint of like what the these things are and how this all works. And then we can be like, oh, not like two pages of info dumping so we can catch us up on this conversation. Like if you wanted to info dump, well, why did you start by info dumping? Why wait? <laughs> why be a sleeper cell? And, and... Also why this is stupid, <laughs> aside from the info dumping, if the immediate suspicion of a person in this universe upon hearing that somebody doesn't want a favor from the Duke and Duchess, if like the conclusion that you can so boldly leap to is that they might be on the side of like the baddies, why would this lady who is very confident that this girl she's talking to is the maiden 
why would she tell the maiden that she's got no use for the Duke and Duchess? That, like, that seems like a poor strategy on this lady's fault. I mean, I was criticizing Poppy for being like, but you should tell on me. And now this lady is like, I don't need to tell on you because like I low-key hate the government. <laughs> and you're like, why? Why are any of you doing the things you are doing right now? All of you are stupid. <laughs> and this is so stupid. <laughs> oh no. Okay, well, let's, let's carry on, shall we? Let's crack on. It's very hard to know, but I'm fairly certain this world doesn't have electricity because... That's the vibe I get. So it's very uh, immersion breaking to have her think to her, or to have, anyway, to have the text say, I froze, utter shock rippling through me, shorting out all common sense. Shorting out? Like electricity? Was there no other way that you could say this that would make more sense for this universe and with what you have access to? In this universe? No. This is just, it's weird. It could have been the sense of authority that seemed to bleed from his pores. Pores don't bleed. It, you can say it oozes from his pores, drips from his pores. You could say that the sense of authority that seems to course through his very blood or something, but bleeds from his pores, and I'm just like picturing him having Ebola. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> These like visual metaphors in this book are not working for me. I would just also quickly like to say that now I'm on page 38, and these first 38 pages have had a criminal amount of telling over showing. Like the amount of like info dumps that we get, the amount of like just th this whole paragraph where we had the bleeding pores is a massive info dump about this fella that just showed up whose name's Hawk, wouldn't you know it? And like, it's, it's, it's not subtle. We just, he shows up and now we get a giant paragraph that takes up more than half the page info dumping about him being like a wild cat with bleeding pores of authority and it's bad, it's bad. Sorry, uh. It wasn't just this paragraph that's an info dump about this man. This info dump is carried on to the bottom of the next page. And let me take a quick peek. Okay, so it ends on the top of the next, so like three pages of info dumping. Or sorry, two whole pages of info dumping about this guy. Like, I would like to know what's going on in the scene. Is he just waiting for her and she like goes all matrix and like has an info dump in her head like it's it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot and it's the most cringy cliche stuff that i've read in a long time uh, wouldn't you know it he's got amazing eyes and an amazing jaw and it's everything's chiseled and everything's piercing and everything is just like male as fuck but he's beautiful and she's just like all jelly over him and like uh, uh, I don't know what I expected. Oh, but sorry, let's not forget. <laughs> this first info dump about this fella with the chiseled everything is also already telling us that he's in pain. My God. Was there just like a checklist for stuff that makes women wet? And this is just going like point by point going, got the eyes, got the jaw, got the cheekbones, got the height, got the bleeding pores of authority. <laughs> and he's always in pain. <sighs> Are you wet yet? I rescind my earlier criticism about electricity because apparently on page 62 I've learned that there is in fact electricity in this world and I must say as much as I like I don't especially love heavy amounts of description of the how places look how people look whatever I'm just I am not nothing's being described other than the liquid dresses and the sexiness of the people. Like, I am not picturing this world at all, and I realized it's because none of it's been described at all. And, like, it's quite a shock on page 62 to hear that her quarters, like, she stays in them because of, like, because she's able to sneak out of them. And then that more than makes up for the fact. Um, she said that the door was one of the reasons I'd never asked to be moved to the newer renovated parts of the stronghold. It, it more than compensated for the lack of electricity and the constant chilly draft, blah, blah, blah. So apparently there's electricity, but they mainly fight with daggers. 
it's like what she's got to protect herself with is a dagger, not a gun. And like the guards that she's described training, like they've got swords. Swords and electricity, no guns, no electric weapons of any kind. Like tasers? Nope. I'm just, I'm very, very confused. So it's been a minute since I checked in with you, so I figured I should check in, because I haven't. Um, and it is nearly Thursday. It is, because it's Wednesday, but it's almost midnight. Um, I am at my parents' house, as I said I would be. Um, reading Blood and Ash tonight. Um, I've just been reading for a little while before bed, and I'm not far into it. I'm not even at 200 pages, because last night, <laughs> Unlike tonight, last night, after I filmed a couple of clips of me reading, I got sleepy like immediately. I went to bed at like 9.30, like, and then today I had a very busy day. So I didn't get much reading in during the day. Um, so, and I'm about to go to bed because it's half midnight. Um, so I have a lot of reading to do tomorrow and Friday and I am not looking forward to it because <clears throat> This book is not getting better. I can't keep filming clips every single time a sentence is badly written because it's every sentence. It's literally every sentence. Like not all of them are so egregious as the ones that I singled out for um, execution, <laughs> but none are good. Like literally none. It's so, it's pretty painful to read. And then the plot, like there isn't a plot yet and I'm almost 200 pages in. So if this was a movie, like the inciting incident has not yet occurred. <laughs> this, by the way, used to be my mug. I bought it at Disney World and brought it all the way home to California. Um, but my dad stole it. So I only get to drink from it when I'm at my parents' house. And Yozies, um, yeah, so there really isn't a plot yet. There's just like lots of cringy character moments. And um, this whole thing about the maiden, like the world is like, I already complained is like not described at all, basically. Basically at all. What is explained is poorly explained, so I can't really like extrapolate from what's explained any further like assumptions about the world or what I meant to understand about it. And okay, so like we've been told over and over and over again, and the back of the book fucking tells you that she, Poppy, Penelope, is the maiden. And apparently that's a big fucking deal. And it needs, must needs be protected and guarded and kept pure and like woe betide you if you besmirch her maidenhood. And we're told over and over again that her being the maiden is like tied to or important to or related to the ascension. And there are ascended that have gone through ascension and something to do with gods. And that's all I know. I'm not being vague. I'm not like skipping over bits. That's literally all that's known, basically. And I just found out on page one, 160 that apparently the ascended, i.e. the people who went through ascension, are nocturnal for some reason. I, I guess they're vampires then. Because also it's been alluded to that the ascended are immortal. But it sounds like it's just like human people. They go through ascension and become ascended. And for some reason, our main character is the maiden. It is, it remains entirely unclear why, like, her virginity in particular is tied to mold. It's, and they, they keep making it clear, too, that it's not just her ascension that is tied to her virginity. It's everybody's ascension this go round. Like, this in like this graduating class needs to have its valedictorian be pure basically is how it comes across and like the world is like is is fairly medievalish i mean obviously its purity conventions seem archaic and then the swords and daggers and guards guarding the maiden but they all talk like they're on the cw and there's again as i mentioned before electricity so like i'm just like i don't even know what i'm supposed to be picturing I don't care about anything. There isn't even a plot to keep me going. Well, I wonder, because I'm just like, nothing is happening. Like, stuff's happening, but it's just like, you know, she's like going about her day, feeling some kind of way about some guy that she had a, like explicit encounter with who was like the most CW described guy ever. <laughs> like some people getting murdered. She's like, 
going about her day wondering stuff and it's like almost 200 pages and like I just I, what what is this if I was reading it for the romance there's not nearly enough of that and I mean I am frankly I'm delighted about that because the bit it opened quite early with romance and I was like oh my god we're starting here like is it just gonna be like this the whole time but no we moved away from that but we're not really doing anything else and if I was reading it for the romance I'd be like where's the romance I would like to read it for the plot there is no plot there certainly isn't any character work being done no incredible themes are being explored it's just a big old fat bunch of poorly written nothing but I have to read like 400 more pages so I just thought I'd let you know <laughs> before I call it a night and uh be reading the rest tomorrow and Friday so that I can be ready for the live show which will be spicy. There have been so many things that I almost got up to get my camera to tell you about and I was like ugh whatever nah like I can't keep stopping I need to fucking finish this book I have so much of it left to go I was like I can't keep stopping to complain about shit even though everything is stupid but this one I was like nah I gotta I gotta <laughs> So, Hawk, Mr. Sex Man, has become Poppy's newest guard. Everyone's surprised. Because previous guard died in some mysterious, tragic way. And I felt nothing. So, uh, he's, like, talking all flirty and, and you, know, you know how they do. The purring and the, the flashing eyes and the blah, blah, blah. But, okay, so, he just learned her nickname is Poppy. Uh, cause the, her friend said Poppy and he's like Poppy and she's like yeah it's her nickname. Poppy he repeated in a way that made it sound as if my name was wrapped in chocolate and would roll off his tongue. Um the, the name Poppy is quite short and in fact it, it's quite like um there's a word for that but like there's not a lot of like vowel sounds in it not a lot of soft sounds like if it had a lot of L's in it or Something you could, I mean, it's still a really dumb way to put it, but poppy? How did something that was all like, there's a word for it again, or like words that are like made in the front of your mouth versus like the tongue versus like the back of your throat. Anyway, the poppy is like all here. So how did he make puppy sound like it was gonna be wrapped in chocolate and rolling off his tongue? Puppy. That's a neat trick, sir, I'm not gonna lie. That's a neat trick, most impressive. I am now wet for you as well. So friends, I did it. I finished From Blood and Ash by Jennifer L. Armandrout. And I'm about to, well, I'm about to. I mean, this morning we're doing the live show for it. So I decided to sneak in like a wrap up of my thoughts before that, in case my friends change my mind or something, I don't know. Yeah, so I stopped filming clips <laughs> because every sentence made me wanna die. Every plot point, I use air quotes because there isn't really a plot, uh, made me want to die. Um, and I had, I had to finish this. <laughs> like if I, this wasn't a live show thing, like if I was just like for some other reason picking up a book that I did not want to read and vlogging it and I had my, I could take my time, I probably would have kept going and just stopping. But I needed to finish before today. <laughs> so I knew that like the sentence structure was going to kill me. So I got it on audio and just knocked it out on audio yesterday all the way through. And <laughs> I thought about breaking out my camera because like while I was in the kitchen, I was like, you know, I had my headphones on and I was like doing stuff in the kitchen and I was like <laughs> stirring my tuna list tuna salad while um, there were some, you know, R-rated things happening. And like I could feel my face while I was stirring being like, <laughs> But I was like, what, like two like seconds of me stirring and grimacing, like I don't know if that's that's worth it. I'll just tell you about it, like I just did. So, just imagine I have a bowl and headphones, and you've got it. This book was uh, everything I hate. <laughs> yeah, a while ago, I filmed or I posted a video called like What Makes a Book Bad, uh, brought to you by the Air Awakened series by Elise Kova. Um, and this reminded me, and, and it had a lot of the things in it that the Air Awaken series has. So I would say if uh, you're watching this and you haven't read it yet and 
you are still interested in reading it. <laughs> um, even though I'm, I've spoiled things. I would say if you like the Air Awakened series by Elise Kova, you would probably like this and vice versa. If you like From Blood and Ash, then I recommend the Air Awakened series if you haven't read it because I hated it. <laughs> but they're quite similar and both are quite popular. So I feel like I am clearly not the target audience for this. I don't understand those, like what people are getting out of these, but clearly they're getting something out of it because both series are very popular. So, okay, so nothing was a surprise uh, except for like how much I hated it and how bad it was. Like I was quite nervous that like I wasn't gonna love this, but it was worse than I thought it was gonna be. The writing I've covered extensively, <laughs> how bad. Just the prose. The prose is bad. Like borderline improper grammar. At times it's not borderline. It is actually an incorrect sentence a lot of the time. But so then the, the plot, um, it felt like it was just, we were jumping from wish fulfillment to wish fulfillment to wish fulfillment. It was just like a collection of scenes that the author like felt some kind of way about <laughs> and wanted to write. So it's just like orchestrated events to like get us to the next one and then to the next one, and then to the next one. And not, everything felt contrived for that reason. It felt like it was just there to like create the opportunity to have this scene that the author wanted to have, uh, to create this moment, or even to give the opportunity for characters to say a line, because the line was like, you could tell, like this scene was here to have this line, because we're all gonna cream our pants over it or something. That certainly wasn't. And then like the mystery was, it was basically, like I said, it was like thrown in class. I was like, so the twist is that there is no twist? Because it's basically, okay, so like the plot, if there is one, is this girl, Penelope, Poppy, just like going about her day every day, not knowing diddly about like her own world and feeling some kind of way about this like Mr. like resand hotness dude who's like acting real sus all the time. And everyone who's handling her is acting real sus all the time. And everything in her life is real sus all the time. And she's just like, but that's just how it be. And I feel so trapped. And let me just soapbox about feminism for a second internally. Let me soapbox about women's agency. Let me soapbox about women's autonomy of their, on their, over their bodies. But then let me go back to being dumb and ineffectual. <laughs> And like, oh, oh my god, the, uh, Air Wagons did this all the time, and this book did it too. Where like, it's just not believable or realistic and it's unearned when your main character shows up and like does something and other characters comment on it. And you're like, once in a while for a Karen to be like, damn, like, you're kind of badass. But every time she did something, there had to be another character around to be like, oh, I wasn't expecting a girl to be so skilled or like, wow, she can really hold her own, or like, she's brighter than you thought, isn't she? Just like someone chiming in from the chorus to be like, she's the shit. <laughs> like that's not character development and that's not building up her image because it's not believable or realistic that all these characters are just like singing her braises all the time. And she's just like, and then the main guy, oh my God, his lines were so, so cringe. And like, I, I am here for it and I agree that it should be there, that like romances should have explicit consent it's nice, even if it is slightly unrealistic, it is nice to have a dude who like cares about her first and her needs first, her pleasure first, whatever. But I have had it with these like, like absurd scenes where like in the middle of like love making, the dude will just stop to be like, if you ask me to stop, I will, because I would never do anything that you don't want. And I want you to say that you want me. And if you don't say that you want me, then despite the fact that I need you and it might kill me to not now be inside of you, I will still, like, just like, you're like, oh my God, please fuck off. Like, please fuck off. <laughs> no one talks like this. This doesn't even, like, it can't even fill a like, a fantasy need because it's too unbelievable. I'm like, no. Like, if that happened, IRL, I'd be like, chill, dude, chill. <laughs> and again, like, the characters, like, they constantly talk about how much they are into each other and need each other, or they are banging. Uh, I mean, I don't mean actual banging, but like, like I, I mean, they do do that, but, or doing something touchy, <laughs> kissing and like, or wanting or thinking about how they want to. And it's all, that's lust. Like, <laughs> newsflash, that's not love, that's lust. 
and the amount of times where they conflate those things is nauseating. And when they're like, oh, but you know, I think I love him. I'm like, why, why, why do you love him? You lust for him. And that is understandable because he's been described as a god among men, chiseled everything. <laughs> so sure, you wanna hit that? Girl, I, you know, I feel you, you hit that. And when he, like, what does he see in her? Like, apparently, I guess she's pretty, apart from the fact that she's got some scars on her face that she feels very, uh, like, embarrassed about. Which there's some justification for that, even though the, the way it was handled by the book, the scenes that were written to establish this, that she's been abused by abusive bullies, like physically abused and verbally abused by them. Um, and it, you know, it's really toxic. Like that type of situation, like that would be an absolutely interesting and relevant and important thing to portray. But the way it was portrayed was just as ham-fisted and unrealistic as everything else. <laughs> so I, I couldn't like appreciate what it was doing because what it was doing was just like, it felt less like it wanted to explore like the trauma of long-term abuse and more like it wanted to establish that abuse was going on just so that we could have a scene where the dude finds out about the abuse and he's like, how dare they touch you? That's not acceptable. Let me kill the person that was touching you like that. Um, so she can be like, wow, <laughs> like what a guy. <laughs> it didn't, you know what I mean? So like, I couldn't be like, wow, like good job for like handling abuse because it didn't feel like you were handling abuse. It felt like you just wanted to make main guy look even better because he's against this like obviously reprehensible abuse this is not a gray area most people like would be like damn that's fucked up you know like the, the bar is quite low at this point but yeah so like i guess he says i mean he says you're beautiful and she's like wow he thinks i'm beautiful he's probably just saying that and he's like no like i think you're beautiful and she's like wow he said it again like i guess maybe he really means it or something now i'm in love <laughs> because he gave you the time of day because he didn't treat you like an object or like a doormat. And she's like, in love. <laughs> Which like, again, if, this, if I felt like this book was trying to explore how messy and complicated emotions like that are, when like the first person to show you, to treat you like a human being is like, you know, that you'd latch onto that, that makes sense. But the book doesn't feel like it's saying like, like it's just portraying the situation in all its messiness. It's romanticizing the fuck out of it being like, oh, isn't he swoon worthy for giving her the time of day? And you're like, no, no, he's not. But again, I don't know what he sees in her either because like all he ever has to say about her is you're pretty. And also like, how dare they treat you like this? You deserve better. But like, what is it that you love about her? Because we went, it escalates very quickly. I mean, I say quickly, this is a long ass fucking book, but in terms of like where they're at in their relationship, it's very quick when we get to like, it'll kill me to be without you and I can't live without you. And I'm just like, but why? That y'all wanna bang? I, f I get that. Hormones, pheromones, all the moans. <laughs> I get that. But love, no, 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 honey. This is not love. This is, uh, this is like an abused person latching on to like a, a savior kind of, and it's not healthy and it's not romantic. And it's not handled well, because again, you can tell a story like that, because that does happen. And the, it's not like the, those stories shouldn't be told, but this story isn't telling us the messy, ugly tragedy of that type of situation. It's just setting up all these other people to be like cardboard cutout baddies, so that by contrast, despite all of the villainous things that Hawk does, He's not as bad as these guys who were literally abusing you. So you're like, guess he's better, boyfriend of the year. And yeah, and then again, like aside from the romance, like the, the foreshadowing or the clues that are left for the mystery of like who, who is who and what's going on and who has the power. I don't know why I'm being vague. I mean, mainly I'm being vague just because I don't want to bother explaining it. But not so much because I'm trying not to spoil it, but like, Okay, so like we find out pretty early on that these people, the Ascended, are kind of immortal and they're nocturnal and they're real sus. And they keep taking children from other families and those families never see those children again because they're given to the gods. <laughs> and you're like, and then and you're also told that there are, okay, so the Ascended, those are like, that's the team we're on, even though they're real sus, but the dissenters, <laughs> not D-I-S-S-E-N-T, but dissenters, because ascended and descend, but like 
also sounds like dissenter and they are anti the ascended so like I want to give it credit for wordplay but I also don't because it's stupid where they're obviously anti the government <laughs> and they keep screaming from blood and ash we will rise which like every time that happened I was like this doesn't feel like an organic cry for revolution it feels like it was there so we could call the book this <laughs> which great but yeah I was like okay so the people who are controlling her life everyone it's not like everyone in charge seems really nice except for this one abusive guy they all are kind of horrible and she's like why can't I do anything and why can't I have friends and why am I not allowed to have human things and my life is the worst but I'm the maiden and I get abused physically by these people but I gotta do it because we're the goodies because they wouldn't be doing these things if they didn't need to. I as the reader I'm like okay so the people in charge of you are baddies and possibly vampires because <laughs> they are immortal and nocturnal <laughs> and then I was right they are basically vampires <laughs> and like early early in the book we get told that wolven are extinct and she's got like a wolven bone dagger and I was like okay wolven are not extinct you bothered to tell me about this in the beginning of the book <laughs> because they're definitely not extinct. They're definitely gonna come into it. And they did. So it's basically vampires and werewolves is what we've got going on. And I was like, oh, it's Twilight. <laughs> I got you. And then the reveal that Hawk is actually like the dark one, AKA like the prince of like the Atlanteans. Oh, and let me just say, this book didn't bother to world build at all because in addition to not explaining this religion that is like a pseudo religion that's actually vampires just wanting like a ready steady supply of victims they reference Pompeii, Macedonia, Atlantis <laughs> like real places but we're just like gonna say that there was vampires and shit <laughs> I guess why not <laughs> But yeah, also like the fact that, okay, so the beginning, I was asking my fellow reading buddies, I was like, did I miss something? And I said it in my vlog, I think too, and I was like, did I miss a page? Because I don't understand who these ascended are. Like why, what is the ceremony? What is the ascension? And why do they need a virgin maiden who's veiled her whole life to be given to the gods? Like none of this is explained, like why that's necessary. And like my reading buddies were like, oh, like it's, it's like kind of part of the mystery. Like you'll find out later, kind of. And like the reveal is like, you know, you're not supposed to know because Poppy doesn't know because there isn't really a reason for it because they're the baddies. And I was like, that's so horrible. Like, that's bad writing. For us to go with this and for us to feel like it's a big reveal that they aren't really what they say they are and that this is actually like, they're the baddies. You can't just give us no information other than blind faith. And then the reveal is they're actually the baddies. I'm like, yeah, well, no shit. Why, why, could, why couldn't she write like, poor reasons or some kind of reasons that the maiden Poppy believes are the reasons why this has to happen. Because realistically for them to be so successful at pulling the wool over people's eyes for so long, they would have to have a like, more solid explanation for like the foundation of this faith. So that the re- and then the reader should be told it as well. To be like, well you need the maiden so that she can do this. And even if it's a lie, then that's what she believes. Like I need to be sacrificed so that I can, you know, so that this happens, so that this is how it works, like, people can't ascend and they need me because this, because they even point out, they're like, she's the first maiden in, like, centuries, and, like, but it's really important that she's, a, like, that she ascends. She's like, but what did they do all the centuries when they didn't have a maiden? Like, what's the big deal? What if I don't ascend? Like, what will change? How will that be different? Because, again, they didn't have one a while for all this time, and she doesn't know the answer to it. I'm like, yeah. But she's like, but I have to commit to this. What if I'm unworthy? I'm like, what does any of that mean? Like, again, she sh like, it felt like lazy writing. I get that the reveal is that like, oh, it's because it's a fake religion. Like, but even a fake religion would have to have actual tenets of their beliefs for people to go along with it. So it was bad and stupid and cringy and I wanted to die. <laughs> okay, I think I'm, I'm out. That's all I have to say. So yeah, nothing was surprising. Nothing was shocking. Nothing was romantic. Nothing was epic. The, the prose was bad. The dialogue was bad. World building was non-existent. It was terrible. It was one of the worst things I've ever read. Like one of the worst. <laughs> like I think I might like Air Awakens better. Little <laughs> teeny bit, like half star better. Um, and I think I, I definitely like, I Serpent and Dove, I gave two stars. I gave this one star. The Serpent and Dove at least had moments that kind of had me laugh. Like there was actually like occasional humor that worked for me. And I was never, <laughs> this whole book, I was just like, so, so do, do not recommend. We'll say 10 out of 10, love this cover. And <laughs> I didn't draw attention to it uh, before, but I decided it was a maiden always has to wear white. 
So, because she's, you know, virginal, maiden, or whatever, purity, etc. So I decided to go with this because I felt kind of maiden-y. And then the cover, you know, and the blood, I decided to go for like a blood red lip. So I hated it, but I did dress for the occasion. Also, this kind of has vampire vibes. <laughs> and they're basically vampires. <laughs> So yeah, that does it. Let me know in the comments down below if you've read from Blood and Ash, how you felt about from Blood and Ash. If I've convinced you not to read from Blood and Ash, which how could I not have? <laughs> Let me know all the things. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays. So like and subscribe. And I'll see you when I see you. Bye.